Well, welcome everyone. Today is June 14th, 2021, and we are recording this show for a future broadcast. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. My guest today is Rosalind Case, who is an adjunct research fellow at the Department of Epidemiology and Preventative Medicine at Monash University. Did I say that right, Rosalind? They say it Monash here. Monash. Monash. And senior clinical psychologist in the heart transplant service at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Welcome, Rosalind. We are so excited to have you. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to join you. So I will just say for the audience, it is 6 a.m. Uh, here as we are recording this in Vermont. And what time is it where you are, Rosalind? So it's 8 p.m., um same day though yeah so same day yeah <laughs> i won't tell you what happens today all right a little that's great thank you we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll uh, be curious throughout the day um and so just a little bit about Rosalind and uh her background she has a her phd in psychology and postgraduate diploma in clinical psychology at the university of waikato am i saying that right so, uh, almost, that's a Maori word from New Zealand. So, University of Waikato is how we pronounce it. Great. Um, in Hamilton, uh, New Zealand. And she leads a program of research investigating the neurocognitive and psychosocial outcomes of cardiac arrest, survivors and their families, with a focus on translational outcomes and the development of post-arrest clinical services. There will be a test at the end of this for the audience who has to repeat that phrase. Now, we'll talk more about that. At the end, um, we're pretty excited. Uh, what led us to uh, interviewing Dr. Case was just an incredible interview she gave in Vice.com about decision making. And we wanted to understand what would be necessary in order for a person who had vocalized their decision not to get vaccinated against COVID-19 to change his or her mind. Uh, but before we get there, we're going to learn a little bit more about Dr. Case uh, and, and her background and her current research. So just tell us, where did you grow up and, and what was it like? Yeah, thanks. I grew up in a little village of about 200 people. Um, have you seen Lord of the Rings? I have. I've read the book a long time ago, but I've seen the movie too. So you grew up in Lord of the Rings? I, yes, I'm a hobbit. No, <laughs> but I grew up near Hobbiton. So um, the part of the, the films that are filmed in the Shire around Hobbiton, that's mostly up in the middle central North Island of New Zealand, very green, lush dairy farming region. Wow. And if you go there now, you can actually still go and see the Hobbit houses in the, built into the side of um, a, a man's farm. They've just left them there. Wow. So 200 people, that is very small of, a, of an area. Yeah. And then how did you get to where you are today? Well, it's a bit of a zigzaggy story, but my mum was a nurse and she actually opened one of um, the first psychogeriatric rest homes um, in New Zealand, so in the 80s, um, when they were moving away from bigger psychiatric asylums, she um, had an interest in old elder care. So we opened, we had a very small eight bedroom rest home on our dairy farm. Um, and yeah, so that just, I just, from the time I was five years old, had a really close interest in um, holistic aspects of care, really. Um, and yeah, how the, the social and the, um, the emotional parts um, were important in the physical bit as well. And that takes so much patience. Uh, you know, that's an honorable thing for your mom to do with that cognitive decline uh, as folks get older and recognizing what it takes to, to help them continue to live the rest of their life uh, in a way that limits suffering uh, and, and is not um, in the medical system prolonging something that doesn't need to be there. We need uh, cognitive function. I've gone through that in my own family as well, and most probably people in the audience have. So you were on the dairy farm, and then off you went? Yeah, so then we, we um, later on moved to the nearest city was uh, about, oh, I suppose, how do you say, what is a mile? I'm thinking kilometers and miles, about 30 kilometers away, so maybe that's 20 miles. Sure. In Hamilton, that's where the University of Waikato is. So I went to high school there and then I did a psychology degree and I just loved it. Um, and just, yeah, just oriented towards clinical psychology. Um, 
and have quite a diverse training, really. Um, you had to have a diverse training. So you do a little bit in prisons and forensic settings and with children and young people and older people. And um, and I've always, yeah, I guess I always maintained that interest in more medical aspects of psychology as well. Sure. So so tell the audience here, what what's your normal day like then? And what who are you working with and what are you doing? Yeah, look, I'm really lucky to have a lot of variety in my daily life and in my week. And I'm the sort of person that needs it. I don't like to just be in one setting all the time. So I work about two and a half, three days a week in the heart transplant service here in Melbourne, um, which is a really amazing service in a big hospital called Alfred. And that is a pretty interesting role where I'm working with people um, earlier on in their journey through heart failure towards assessing people um, as to whether they would be a candidate for transplant and then supporting people all the way through the journey and beyond. So that's never the same. Some days I'm on the ward, sometimes I'm in the intensive care, sometimes I'm on telehealth or yeah, it's, it's really diverse. And then I spend about a day and a half a week just doing my research, usually from home, that just mainly means doing admin, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, especially during COVID. I'm not out and about um, seeing people as much. We Melbourne had probably one of the strictest lockdowns in the world last year. We were we were locked down for most of the year, really. Wow. Just, um, just to diverge for a second, how are things there now, just so the audience is aware? Look, really good and probably really hard for someone in the US to get their head around mm -hmm. how it's worked here and in New Zealand. So they went for really active elimination strategies. Um, but we, Melbourne did kind of have a little bit of a blowout. I think at its worst, we had about 700 cases a day. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, shocking. But we, for the last six or eight months, we've been pretty open with really no cases in the community. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a, a little blip of about 15 cases. And so we went straight back into a two-week lockdown. And we're still masks indoors and outdoors. Um, and we had today had zero cases, but we're still not fully open. We still can't have people in our homes. Right. So okay. it's a very different approach. And are, are people getting vaccinated? Yes, although, unfortunately we haven't had the really efficient rollout of um, vaccines in this part of the world. It's mm -hmm. been lovely to watch um, the US do this so well. Um, it's been a while, I think, since we'd looked at the United States and gone, they're doing that really well. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's been incredible to see how that's rolled out for you guys. Because, because um, oh, for a number of reasons, supply, um, because we didn't have lots of cases, we sort of got shoved to the back of um of the queue a little bit so definitely people want to get vaccines but they like this week if you're trying to book Pfizer you would be waiting for up to August to try to even get an appointment sure so we're going to get into some of the decision making that's involved there let's go back to the to the stuff you're doing day to day with the patients awaiting heart transplant and I and I assume you work with them after they've received their heart transplant. And I think that, um, you know, it makes so much sense, but, but even uh, physicians and nurses and in the community, they don't think about the psychological impacts involved in such a very major part of someone's life. So just talk a little bit more about that and the types of cases you see and, and how you help them. Sure. Um, well, it's, and it's, it starts even earlier, you know, so there's a really, there's a big, um, I think a long phase for a lot of people with heart failure, um, particularly if that's something maybe that they've had for a long time um, and they've had this, this thing in the background at some point, they might need a transplant, but it's all pretty hypothetical. And then what seems to happen is it goes downhill quite fast and all of a sudden you're having to make some decisions. And some people um, have been kind of living a healthy life with that in the background but for other people um are really struggling with you know with smoking with substance abuse alcohol use um for a variety of reasons mental health reasons and 
Um, so, yeah, trying to to make the decision, you know, that you want to transplant, but also that you're going to be able to remember to take your medication because if you miss the um, immunosuppression medication once you've had a transplant, the risk of rejection is um, very high and, and, and an ongoing risk, you know, 5, 10, 20 years down the track. Do you so find pretty good success uh, in working with folks? Look, I, I, I wouldn't attribute it to me. Right. Um, I think... <laughs> I'm pretty new to that team, um, but the team itself has been doing this work for a long time, and they do have very good success, but it's definitely um, a team effort. So you have occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and very, very close contact from nurses before and after. Um, people come, you know, after maybe three or four months in hospital, after you get a heart transplant, then you come to the hospital three days a week for at least three months to do rehabilitation and weekly cardiac biopsies. And, it, you know, it's very, very intensive. So, so yeah, um, I try to focus on those, you know, are there factors that can help a person in their psychological adjustment, you know, in terms of if you've got depression, anxiety beforehand, can we try to improve that before you go into surgery? Um just so that you're in the best shape possible. And sometimes we're focused on just trying to make those behavioral changes. And then afterwards, yeah, it's a real long stretch for people. And it's not just the initial part, but when people are getting to sort of six to 12 months later, um, thinking about, okay, well, going back to work, rehabilitation, you know, in the long term, what's that look like? So it's an ongoing thing. It's really pretty, you know, unique and it's a real privilege to, to work in that area. Well, there's, I mean, I can see the similarities and some differences in what your mother was doing uh, with cognitive decline. And these folks, I mean, both both groups of people are at their most vulnerable part in life. And this is a time that you can make a difference and feel really great about it. But I'm certain that you often try extremely hard. Your team tries extremely hard uh, and is not successful. And that must be tough. Uh, I assume since you're a researcher, you you analyze the situation, see what worked, what didn't, and and move forward uh, with the next next patient. So let's talk about COVID nineteen. And um, again, you've written about this in Vice.com. Uh, but let's just I'm going to ask a few questions, and you just keep elaborating. But from a clinical perspective, you know what factors uh, affect our decision making on something like like COVID nineteen vaccine, whereas on other vaccines people often just didn't think about it. They just went and got them. And a few percentage of the population might uh, think harder. But um, yeah. I'll, I asked a lot of questions there, so I'll just let you elaborate. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're quite right. I mean, that vaccine hesitancy or feeling hesitant or worried about getting a vaccine, not feeling confident about it, um, is, you know, one of the terms we use. And there, we also use the term vaccine resistance, which I guess is more that those more adamant people who are like, you know, really kind of opposed. Mm -hmm. um, those those two things are a little different. Um, but one of one of the things that has already been researched, even though COVID's pretty new, there's already been quite a lot of research specifically into this topic, um, has revealed that it's there's more hesitancy for people due to the amount of misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. that is available um and a general sense that people are concerned about whether things have been expedited so kind of rushed through mm -hmm. um so uh, at least one study has looked at um people's willingness to take the covid vaccine if they thought it had gone through a normal authorization process um, and that was certainly higher than if they thought that it had been rushed through so I think that's probably compounded by just a lack of understanding in the general population through nobody's fault except the fact that the medical community does a poor job of communicating in, about this stuff right. about what a clinical trial involves how many participants are normally involved how long it normally takes and um, what it actually means to to decide something safe so I think um when something's new, people want to pause and wait and sort of see, oh, let's just see if, if Bob next door gets a vaccine and drops dead, 
I probably won't go there. So let's see if Bob Bob can be the guinea pig. Right. And it's so interesting. Um, boy, we could just talk about this forever. And uh, just the psychology behind it, because people are dropping dead from SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but that sort of background, um, it's almost different than receiving a vaccine, which is extremely safe. And, you know, I will have to tell you, I've learned so much. I know you you have too, but I've learned so much during this pandemic uh, about people's reactions. When we first started um, preparing for, in, in earnest, for vaccine delivery here uh, in a small area, rural area in Vermont, we still planned for cars to be lined up, you know, throughout the town waiting for vaccine. And, it, and we did receive a, a good initial bolus. But after that, uh, the, the numbers of people seeking vaccine dropped. And it made me concerned that the, that that rest of the group that hadn't been vaccinated were those people that were resistant, as you mentioned. But it turns out that's not the case. Um, so many of them either had questions, like you said, regarding uh, the speed at which the vaccine uh, came to the market, or um, interestingly, just convenience. They just it wasn't on the top of their mind. And I, and I kept thinking, my gosh, guys, we're in a pandemic. This should be the first thing on your mind, uh, you know, beyond your family and, and life uh, sustaining processes. The next thing should be getting your vaccine, but it's not for a lot of people. So when we just did simple things, once we had the adequate supply uh, to vaccinate people who happened to be walking by, coming to the hospital for other reasons, downtown uh, at a local motel, the number of people who said, sure, uh, I tell you, first off, it surprised me, but also made me very happy. And I'm sure that is factoring into some of the research and thoughts you're doing or seeing among your colleagues in, in the psychology of whether or not to get the vaccine. Yeah, I've, I was reading something um, the other day, actually, that was talking about uh, when it comes to vaccine confidence and not just in regards to COVID, you, yeah, or ve- there's confidence, complacency and convenience. And so our confidence around whether it's safe and effective, and that requires, you know, us to do our own risk-benefit analysis based on the information we've got, how we assess risk to ourselves and the community is different for for people. So that's one whole thing. Complacency in terms of how, how urgent is this? So in the last few weeks in Melbourne, um, it was good the government made it slightly more available, but there was a massive pickup in demand for the vaccine because people realised, oh, no, it's back. We all got so complacent. We thought, oh, cool, we got rid of it. We're just, like, going right. and having normal lives. And then to have to go to see it pop up so quickly and um, have to go back into lockdown, well, the, the the benefit of getting the vaccine starts to sort of, you know, make it worth the effort um, and then, yeah, the the convenience part. So can you actually find one? Do you have to wait on hold on a phone? Um, right. When you work, you know, full time, how are you even supposed to do that, you know? Um, so all those things are so important. And I think that, you know, you mentioned earlier uh, that m- the medical community in general has done a poor job or not such a good job of communicating to the public. And I completely agree. That's true. And I think we're learning a lot. We also, um, so to put a little defending in there, haven't really needed to as much. And sometimes, you, unfortunately, you have to wait and go through a bad process to learn and revamp. And I hope that we're doing that, you know, internationally uh, with this vaccine. You know, some groups have been doing it well. Um, the Red Cross, um, Doctors Without Borders, many other groups have been communicating well. Uh, but in general, I agree with you that medicine has not. It tends to be insular, uh, published in, in journals that people can't read and understand. And I tell you, I've learned a lot. I know my colleagues have learned a lot in discussing with patients uh, questions. Let's just go back to the one that you initially talked about, and that is that the vaccine was developed so quickly. Um, and I tend to just get defensive and rush into, but you don't understand, people weren't working on anything else. So all they were working on seven days a week, whether it was an entire corporation or a scientist at the bench or researchers, what was this vaccine? So in a sense, um, it was about the same time. It was just a a, a much more concentrated effort. But then people look at me with glassed eyes. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear a language that makes them feel more comfortable that the vaccine is safe. And they want to hear it sometimes from their peers and colleagues who aren't necessarily 
uh, clinical psychologists or emergency physicians. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I don't, I don't mean to ascribe blame either to uh, you know doctors on the ground. I think it's um, it's a wider issue that you know you're probably conscious of as well that so many people access information from questionable sources these days, which is absolutely their right and absolutely not their fault in terms of being able to assess the quality of the source. Um, And I think the internet, you know, has taken off at such a speed over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, And we really haven't caught up, medicine and science haven't caught up in terms of empowering people and instead of this kind of you know you think of I sort of imagine um medieval priests you know who were the only ones that were allowed to read right and the priests didn't read and and then medicine kind of grew <laughs> out of that this you know quite paternalistic yeah. um thing that you don't need to you don't need to worry yourself about that just listen to your doctor and your doctor will tell you that was probably easier when we knew our doctors, but a lot of people don't even have a relationship with a doctor. They see a different physician every time, certainly here in Australia, when they go and see their general practitioner or their their local family physician, they see someone different every time. So why would you trust that person, you know, um, in the same way that if you'd had the same doctor all your life? So at the same time, we've got everyone's on social media. We know that people who access information about vaccines via social media are much more likely to be hesitant about the COVID vaccine than if they are accessing information from more mainstream sources or medical professionals. You bring Um, up so many good points there. I I think you also bring up the point that um, a variety is needed. Uh, Like, for example, you talked about telemedicine earlier as a part of your day-to-day um, and that's that's the same uh, here in, in our local practice. But it's not the panacea uh, because you do have some disadvantages. And one is losing that familiarity. And familiarity is really what, what breeds trust. Um, but but they're also great applications. And then something else that you, you know, brought up there was, I think in our scientific discussion, we understand risk because it's what we do a lot. Um, Just like I'm not the greatest person with finance or uh, how my uh, truck works, I need to go to experts to learn about that. When we talk about risks, we understand that because it's what we do from a day to day. But to the general public, risk is not a part of their uh, normal discussion. So if we start talking about, oh, you know, your chances of a bad outcome from vaccine are less than being struck by lightning, that's not going to compute with them as well. They need something else. They need a different description. And so I hope we are learning that in medicine. And as you say, maybe start going on some other platforms like social media. Uh, we certainly have in the pandemic gone uh, to regular media, print media, much more than in the past. And I think that's helped. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I think generally beyond you know, the responsibility of the medical community, we need to be educating people from a very young age within the education system to be able to um, understand and read scientific papers that you people need to be able to do that now these are not things that are hidden away in dusty journals right they're on the internet um give let's give you know the next generation the tools to understand and then when people say do your own research they'll actually be able to at least review the research and understand what they're reading. And I don't want to sound patronising in saying that, but it wasn't until I was sort of at a master's level that I really felt like I could review a journal article about a a, a scientific study and look at it and understand, oh, that effect size means this and that means that. And, you know, it's, it's dense and it's, we're not taught it. Right. I think you're exactly right. Science and math uh, as a part of education, not all of education, but part of education is so important. I hope we're making some progress uh, in, in certain parts of the world in that regard. You know, you also mentioned um, well, working with patients and, and a term that was in the background there that shows we are trying to progress is, is the shared decision making um, and, you know, working rather than this paternalistic aspect. 
working together. But we stumbled there too, um, because people don't want to just be handed four choices uh, and say, you decide, because that's why they've come to us in the first place. Uh, so it's more of shared guidance, right? Here are the reputable sources for you to review. I'm going to teach you some stuff. I'm going to tell you what I would do, but the, ultimately the decision is yours. So you do this in, in, your, in your research. What do you tell people, um, and do you have a standard approach for in, informed decision-making, uh, whether that's cardiac arrest or other aspects of your uh, interaction with patients? Um, I know, I, I actually heard one of our heart failure nurses saying the other day, um, did, did we give her the list of re reputable websites? Because we know that people are going to go away and Google things, and there are so many bad websites. So rather than telling people don't Google, going, look, here's some material that we think is more accurate, um, and hopefully if patients trust their team, they will believe that enough, you know, to go away and do that. I think um, using um, what we call motivational interviewing techniques, um, which is a kind of a dumb name for really just actually engaging with people and asking them questions. Um, and rather than lecturing people, um, you know, if people lecture us or nag us or patronise us or tell us we're wrong, so if a patient comes with concerns about something and we go, no, you're wrong, they're probably going to dig into resistance and they're going sure. to feel like they don't understand them and then they're going to go away and find someone socially probably or in their family who does agree with them and the feedback loop kind of begins. So that's not a helpful way to um, invite people to consider more information. So being empathetic to people's concerns, validating them, and then asking questions, you know, why, um, you know, what might be a benefit of you getting the COVID vaccine? What might some of the benefits for the community be? Um, and how do you think those might weigh up against the risk? And actually inviting people to have those conversations rather than just telling them. Um, is being found to be a much more effective way to get people to open their minds and also think about changing their minds. Absolutely. And, and then asking about what are their fears and let's yeah. talk about those. And, and that's such a great opportunity. Um, and I've also found that, you know, from experience that, that if you think about it during your relationship with a patient at work, it's so helpful, but also outside of work and just in the community, those questions sometimes flow a little more naturally and can have just as much, if not more of an impact. Um, so let's just, let me just ask, as we sort of close here, um, you're an academician, you know, you do academic research and, uh, and I think that's incredible. And I think the audience probably, uh, is listening to that aspect. What do you plan on doing in the future as the, as the pandemic across the world, uh, still rages, but will wane at some point, what does your research look like? Yeah, well, I look, I've been doing a lot of work in the cardiac arrest field and now that I'm working clinically in heart transplant those patient groups overlap a lot of people who have a heart transplant have had a cardiac arrest and very similar issues that we see for people who've had a stroke or a traumatic brain injury you know in terms of um, what it's like to experience um, a chronic or life-threatening condition um, so I think I really love the clinical work I'm doing in heart failure transplant, and I think I'd like to orient my research um, in that direction so, so that the clinical work I'm doing and the research are, are really even more aligned because it's a real privilege to be able to get that balance. Um, and I'm just, look, I'm looking forward to traveling again. Australians and New Zealanders, we travel a lot because the rest of the world is out there. Right. Uh, and so I haven't spent a lot of time in the States, but we'd, we'd, I'd go to Europe two or three times a year, usually for a conference. It's a 24 hour flight. So it's like a mission. And we're just really missing the world being open to us. So, um, you know, fingers crossed in the next year or two, we'll be able to get over and um, Vermont's definitely on the list. Well, we'd love to have you. We'd love to have you uh, come give a, a lecture here and then spend the rest of the time 
uh, visiting and going through the Green Mountains uh, and the whole uh, part of wherever you want to go in the country. This is the, the rural, beautiful part, but there's plenty of uh, exciting parts. And, and also, at some point, I know many people in the audience uh, would love to or have already been to Australia and, and New Zealand. Um, yeah, so, let me, <laughs> so let me just close uh, by saying we will also put some of uh, Dr. Case's work, uh, links to uh, that Vice article I mentioned in our show notes. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Medical Matters Weekly. Um, I'm also going to thank Mike Cutler from CAT TV, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, and Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. Next week, we're going to have Kelsey Doolin of the Project Against Violent Encounters in Bennington. Uh, you can send your questions to wellness at svhealthcare.org. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>